Hey, if you're an avid reader of Motor Rage, you know that we've had quite a few articles that talk about how you can use fuel trim to diagnose a variety of drivability concerns. But it's not going to help you very much if you have a question on exactly what fuel trims are, will it? Well, that's the topic for this edition of The Trainer. What are fuel trims? Okay, way back in the good old days, cars had carbureted engines. There wasn't any need to look at or monitor or even have any clue what fuel trim was back in those days. It was pretty straightforward. Air went in the carburetor, it created a low pressure area around the feed from the main jet in the carburetor, and then uh, fuel was pushed from the bowl through that metered orifice and mixed with the air. That's how we got our air fuel mixture. Uh, of course, it wasn't very ac accurate, but back then gas was cheap. We really didn't care. And that's also one of the reasons that back then we had single digit fuel economies for most of the vehicles that where you were driving. But again, it was cheap. We didn't care. Uh, then came the area of emissions standards. And that's where we started to have to be more concerned about mixing the proper amount of fuel with the air that was drawn into the engine. Why? It's all about the catalytic converter. The catalytic converter can take some dirty gas and clean it up to make it kind of uh, passable gas or cleaner gas going out, but it can only do that over a very narrow range. In other words, it can't take something that's really nasty, overly rich, or uh, way lean and turn that into nice gases going out. It has a very narrow range that is acceptable for gases coming into the converter in the first place. Making sure those feed gases getting into the converter are maintained at that very narrow range is the primary job of the engine control module. Uh, yeah, there's some other things that it does, but the engine control module's number one job is emissions, emissions control. And nearly every code, if not every code, P code that you see that can be set by the engine control module is going to impact or, or has some relation to emissions, okay? Uh, now, the ECM keeps an eye on things through a series of tests, group tests that we call monitors, and there are several monitors associated with the engine control module. Uh, we've had other discussions about that. I'm not going to recap them all here. Uh, feel free to check them out and find them, and you can uh, learn about them uh, from the Motor Age website or our YouTube channel. Um, three of the monitors are continuously run, which means they're going all the time. One of those, the one that's of interest today, is a fuel system monitor. Now, the first time you see that fuel system monitor on your scan tool, you may be wondering if that's telling you about the health of the fuel pump or the injectors or the wiring or anything along those lines, and nope, nothing to do with that. Again, that's where it's keeping an eye on the amount of fuel, uh, mixing with the amount of air coming in, whether it's too rich, too lean, maintaining within that standard, whatever's programmed in the computer is an acceptable range. If it gets outside that range, it's gonna set a code, system lit, uh, rich, system lean, okay? Uh, how do we know what it's doing? Well, we take a look at something called fuel trims. Fuel trims are the data parameters, the data PIDs that you see on your scan tool. And most commonly, you're going to see uh, STFT, which stands for short-term fuel trim, or you may see LTFT, which is long-term fuel trim. You may even see one that says RFT for rear fuel trim and TFT on some models for total fuel trim. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. Let's go about basically how all of this comes to play to begin with. Again, back in the old days, X amount of air went through the carburetor and drew X amount of fuel in um, based on what went through in the orifice that was metered in the, in the jet. Today, we need a much wider range of operation. We have to control it from idle all the way through wide open throttle and under every RPM and low condition in between. Uh, we have to first tell the computer how much air is being ingested into the engine, uh, how much is being drawn in. A couple of ways that we do that, uh, the older system, uh, not as much uh, around as it used to be, is called the speed density system, uses primarily uh, a sensor called the manifold absolute pressure sensor and others uh, as the inputs. And then it goes through this calculation to figure out how much air was drawn in. Now, let's make sure we understand something here. We're not talking about the volume of air, we're talking about the weight of air, because that's really what that ideal fuel mixture is based on. It's so much uh, pounds of fuel to so much pounds of air to get that ideal ratio. And depending on the low conditions, that ideal may change, but that's another topic for another time. 
So we, the engine doesn't know how much air is being drawn in. It's got to figure that out. It already knows about the fuel, right? It knows how much the fuel weighs. It knows that if I calculate a certain amount of air, then I'm going to go through my ratio. I need to add such so much fuel. And it knows how to do that by pulsing the injectors a specified amount of time because it knows the amount of pressure behind the injectors. It knows how much the injectors flow. It, it, it has all that information that can be programmed before the car is even run down the assembly line. So the fuel side of the equation is, is a pretty much known quantity. It's the air side that the engine has to figure out. And many times when you're diagnosing a system rich or system lean code, that's what you want to focus on, the air side of the equation. What's wrong with the air side of the equation or what's affecting the air side of the equation, okay? So back to telling the computer how much air is coming in. The other way that's more commonly used today is the mass airflow sensor, uh, MAF uh, sensor that you're probably familiar with. That sensor actually is able to tell the uh, engine control module how much air is being drawn in. So it, that's a given, it's a very accurate measurement. Um, and that's a given that the uh, ECM can then use to add the correct amount of fuel. Now, this is under ideal conditions. This is when the engine's brand new, everything's working the way it's supposed to, uh, but things change, don't they, over time? So other things can impact that. So the engine's gonna make the calculation, it's going to send the fuel to the cylinder to match that air charge that, it, that was reported to it, and then that's gonna pass through the system. How does it know? Well, like everything else in any control module, there's always some type of feedback, and that's why we call this a feedback system. There's some type of feedback to the control module to let it know, was this calculation correct? That is the oxygen sensor, whether it's a conventional or wideband sensor, that's its role, is to let that ECM know, you hit that one right on the money, or no, you were a little rich, or no, you were a little on the lean side. Now again, we're not going into a whole lot of discussion. On cars equipped with conventional uh, oxygen sensors, keep in mind that the oxygen sensor cannot tell the computer exactly how much oxygen was present in the exhaust stream. That's not its job. Think of that one more as a switch. When it crosses the ideal, that voltage is gonna spike one way or the other, up or down, uh, rich or lean. And that's what the computer's looking for. Uh, it's trying to keep it right in the middle, ideally. So let's just say that we send that pulse through and the feedback from the oxygen sensor is, well, hey, that was a little too much fuel. Well, the computer goes, okay, I'm gonna make an adjustment to that the next time. And it does in percentages. That long way around is what you see as short-term fuel trim. That's the STFT number that you see in your data stream on your scan tool. And when you watch it, you'll see it switching. Uh, plus minus, ideally, uh, within minus five or plus five of zero, ideally, is where you wanna see that swing. And the reason it's swinging is because we gotta make that, that oxygen sensor switch swing. We gotta go from one side to the other, so try to keep it pegged in the middle where we want it. So uh, the engine says, okay, I'm gonna back off a little bit. Now it sends a little leaner mixture under the same conditions into the engine, gets the report from the oxygen sensor, and you see how the process goes back and forth. Now what if something happens where that it's not ideal, and again, there's a problem, and it's running too lean for some reason. So the engine is going to keep getting reports from the oxygen sensor, too lean, too lean, I need more gas, I need more gas. So the engine uh, control module is going to oblige, and it's going to start giving more fuel to the, to the system to try to compensate. And you're going to watch that short term fuel trim number, instead of bouncing across zero, it's going to start moving up to scale. It's still going to bounce a little bit, but it's going to keep getting more and more positive as it's adding more fuel. Okay, so positive numbers, more fuel, negative numbers, less fuel, than what the ideal number is. With me? Okay, so th that's one thing you wanna keep in mind as well. What the ideal number is, is either side plus or minus, okay? So as we're going lean, we're gonna start going seeing the short-term fuel numbers get more and more positive. Now, we can't keep this up forever. The system's gotta learn if there's something amiss. Maybe it's just normal wear and tear. It's just the age of the vehicle. It's requiring a slight adjustment in how much fuel it gets. The engine learns and it stores that information under long-term fuel trim, LTFT. And what's the primary difference? Well, the long-term fuel trim is added in right as part of the base computation that the engine is, uh, management computer is making internally when it first decides how much fuel to send. Let me give you an example. Let's just say that we know that from normal wear and tear, I need to add a little bit more fuel than I did when the car was brand new. The short-term fuel trims are gonna show that at first until the system learns. 
and then the long term is going to start adding a little bit more in the base calculation. The computer's thinking, you know, I've been adding this much fuel and it's not doing the job, so I'm going to add 1% more, 2% more, 3% more, whatever that number is, until I see my feedback, my short-term fuel trim, come back to that center and start bouncing back on either side of zero, that minus five, plus five range. And then once I'm bouncing back and forth across zero in the short term, I know my long-term number is on the money and I'm good there. I'm gonna keep using that number. Okay, you with me? There you go. So there's basically the short-term fuel trim and long-term fuel trim. Now again, CAFE standards that are being set by the government, that's corporate average fuel economy for you guys who aren't familiar with the term. These are the standards that the government says the new car makers have to meet in terms of fuel economy. Okay, uh, number's kind of outrageous. I think it's 50 some miles per gallon by the year 2021. That's not that far off. That's a crazy number. Uh, but what we're trying to do, the, the engines are getting more refined, tighter, more tightly rolled by EC. Pretty good numbers across the fuel. They are doing a good job. To do that, they've had to add some other things. One that many manufacturers are now using is the rear oxygen sensor, the one that's downstream of the catalytic converter that was normally reserved primarily to keep an eye on the health of the converter is now being taken in as data input to the ECM for fuel control. And you may see RFT, rear fuel trim, listed as a data PID on your, uh, on your scan tool. Some makes, if I remember correctly, if there's a problem with the upstream, they'll go to the downstream and rely on that one to adjust fuel control. So you may see uh, codes that are related to that kind of an issue. Um, when you're doing troubleshooting with fuel trims, you want to consider the total, the total amount between the short term, the long term, and if applicable, the rear, term, uh, rear trim, um, and take that number as a total number to know how far out of whack you are and what direction that you're going in. You're also going to run diagnostic situations where you're going to have multiple banks, even if it's a four cylinder, could be two banks, just, just a four banger. You want to make sure that you know which bank is doing what and what kind of total fuel trim you're looking at in each bank could often help you with diagnostic direction as to what's causing that, that shift. Uh, let's just take a quick example. What if you're running lean at idle and you're having to add a lot of fuel at idle, but you get up on the highway and you check the total fuel trims and they're pretty normal. What do you think could be causing that? I'll give you a minute. This is actually a great way to test on a MAF equipped, a mass airflow equipped engine for a vacuum leak as the cause of a system lean code. At idle, not so much air is being drawn in, is there? So if there's a vacuum leak, that's going to have more of an impact on the total amount of air being drawn in. It's unmetered. It didn't go through the mass airflow sensor, so the computer has no idea it's there, right? Than it would as if the engine was operating at 2,500 or 3,000 RPM when it's drawing in a whole lot more. So if you have a vacuum leak, typically you'll see the fuel trims way out of whack at idle, more normal at, uh, at cruise speed. This is why when you do a, a fuel trim test, you do want to check it over a test drive circuit. You want to go out at idle, you want to check it at 2,500 RPM, and then it's not a bad idea to get it up on the road in a nice, safe area and do a wide open throttle pass from a rolling start until you get to that first two, uh, one, two shift made so that you can take a look at what's called volumetric efficiency. Again, topic for another time. But that number and a few other little bits of information can help you diagnose a very common problem. Uh, mass airflow sensors that are giving the wrong information to the computer. That's always a possibility that you have to be aware of when you're diagnosing any drivability complaint. Maybe the sensors aren't telling the truth, right? So you want to check that. Uh, you can also look for uh, misfires. You can help find and locate the cause of a misfire based on the fuel trim. You can uh, tell if there's a cat clogged on a, on a two bank system, V6, V8, um, by the fuel trim numbers. There's a lot the fuel trim numbers can tell you that are more than just the fuel being delivered to the engine. Um, but this will get you started. Now you have a little bit better understanding what fuel trims really are. You can go back and read some of those articles that you've read in the past able to make more sense to you and help you speed up your diagnosis. That's going to do it for this edition of The Trainer. I'm Pete Meyer. I'll see you next month.